We're dealing with a wonderful book that we've been studying. How many here are actually reading a, a Life Beyond Belief? How many are actually going along with it with us? It's an incredible book, and it's an amazing book. Life Beyond Belief. Not just a series of beliefs or belief systems, but a direct experience of the beloved of God in your life right here and now. Not a God you get to, but one that you're coming from. Of course, the miracle says that a universal theology is impossible. There'll never be one we'll all agree with, obviously. But a universal experience of God in your life is not only possible, but absolutely essential. So we're going for the experience of the beloved in our life. And so we started off at the beginning of the book, this kind of great talk about awakening. And now we're kind of getting into some hairy stuff about what it means to embody that awakening, what it means to bring it into every area of your life, to bring your wakefulness into all those places in us that remain asleep, that aren't awake. That's the rest of the journey and the rest of the lifetime. It's called Identity and Self-Centered Living, Chapter 9. And I call it the core issue. Today's talk is called Core Issue. We all have a core issue. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, Marie, bring the doorway out. It's been about four, five, six months. I'm not going to do a lot with it, but it just so totally fits in right here. So we've got this doorway, and, and behind us is all that is, I am that I am, unconditional love. And the moment we step through the doorway, out into the birth canal, we experience the conditions of life. Thought, word, deed, habit, and characterization. And those thoughts, the first thoughts that we were experiencing were when we were very young. Right? Mom and dad, left hand, right hand, were physical mom and dad. They're the first ones to sort of flood our belief system with unconscious beliefs. And the truth is, she says in the book, if we were to be an adult looking at what we got fed when we were kids, we'd probably filter a whole lot of what we got handed out, right? Because we'd have that sort of judgment going, well, that's right, but that's not right. That's part of his stuff or her stuff. But when you were small, you didn't have that gift, did you? You just picked it all up and you became it. You soaked it in to the cells and atoms of your being it becomes part of your conditioning while we are here. And one of the biggest places where we bring our wakefulness is to a big place where a whole lot of us remain asleep. And that's that feeling in that sense that everybody carries with them of unworthiness. Everybody feels a sense of being unworthy, of not being good enough. Maybe when you were a child, you were told things that weren't true about your real nature, but became projections from your mom and your dad. And those things, like I'm not good enough, you'll never amount to anything. All those things that those people who loved us most gave to us, not because they were bad, they didn't know any better. We have those things still in us. And she says very clearly in the book, awakening doesn't mean we don't look at those things. In fact, awakening means we might even see more of those things. They'll come up to the forefront and be offered to us for healing. Because whatever remains unconscious, rules us. The thing you fear the most is what comes upon you. It says in the Bible, right? Why? Because it's mostly what you're not in touch with, of what you're afraid of. So you get to know this and witness that when we do this great work of awakening that we're doing. You get to see it for what it is. You get to be aware of it. And I believe, and again, this is my call, but when you get yours, you can have your own story. I believe that there was a great gathering in the invisible realm of spirit before you and I got here. A big, huge conference table. And it was set up with beings who knew us very well. Spiritual beings. And they all decided they were going to help us in the divine plan for awakening that we're all here for. We're here to wake up. And hands went up. Well, let's see. I'll, I'll, I think I'm going to be Rhoda Thelma Hoffman. That's who I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the mother of some children. And I'm gonna be beautiful beyond measure. At 25 years old, I'm gonna be on the original chorus line of Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. And next to me on that chorus line will be Katherine Hepburn. And we will literally be in our 20s. And we will be on our way to a film shoot to become big mega movie stars. But then another hand went up and it was the handsome, debonair, Alvin Harrison Levy. His hand went up and he goes, I'm gonna come and interrupt your plans for this lifetime. I'm gonna sweep you off your feet. I'm gonna be the only son of the Dora Mae fortune. And I'm gonna take you in a different direction because I don't wanna be sharing you. I don't want you being in Hollywood and people looking at you. My dad liked all of his women and he had many along the way. That's a whole nother story. To be with me and that's it. And so they got together and they were like a volatile explosion of energy. 
to know Rhoda and to know Alvin and seeing them to be together was insane. But when I was very little, again, I grew up in the Jew Jewish widow divorce section of Great Lake Long Island. At five years old, my parents were divorced, and I was there. I remember they'd get together, and I remember even at five years old, I'd see them sitting there, and they were so beautiful. And my dad had wealth, he was good looking, and my mother was just gorgeous. They looked great together, and then they would have a little drinky poop and things would once again get nasty. And they weren't yet divorced formally yet, but it was coming. And then they would start the, the fighting. I'm gonna do this very quickly as a visual because Maureen says, you lose me, I'll come and show it to you later in a moment. But I, at those moments, would literally be in the fetal position, in a floor, underneath a chair or a table, hiding in the fetal position, waiting for that fighting and screaming to stop, just really afraid for myself. And what ended up happening as I stood up, one of my core beliefs was I need to protect myself from this. So what I ended up doing, I'll take this out so I don't block you guys, is I ended up developing the same temper that my mother and my father had to get the world to do what I wanted it to do. Anybody relate to that? Mm -hmm. I just did to others what was being done unto me. I just did that. I didn't, I didn't know any differently. I just kept acting out and reacting out from those patterns. I didn't know what else to do. I got to a moment in time when I was talking about how my core issue shows up in my life. And Maureen, I said, Maureen, I need your help. I can't think of an example of some core issue I'm facing. And you know, when you're with someone for 40 years, you think she would take at least 10 minutes to figure out what it was. She knew instantly what my core issue was. It didn't take one second. I said, could you think about it? I don't know what your core issue is. You, know, you always know what someone else's core issue is better than you know your own. Have you ever noticed that about yourself? Because she goes, entitlement. You felt your whole life that you are entitled to it because of who you are. You're Richard Levy, the only grandson of the Dora May Company. There's great wealth coming for you. The birthright says you're going to get all the money, all the millions is going to go to you. So on that one hand, I felt that sense of entitlement on the weekends. When I go back to my house in Great Neck, Long Island, in the Jewish widow divorce section, in a small apartment with my mother, my two sisters, and that obnoxious dog called Chi Chi the Chihuahua, <laughs> I was living a whole other kind of life. It was money on the weekends, but during the week it was just a life in an apartment with other people who were widowed and Jewish and divorced. <laughs> and I remember being there in, 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 in that environment with my mother. And my mother would lean across the table and she'd say to me, you are just like your father. The older you get, the more you look just like him. I got that when I was really young. And as I got older, I got more and more of that. And I knew my mom didn't have good feelings for my father. So I had to sort of recoil, get curled up on the floor, and try to get my mother to love me, try to get people to love me, to try to please my mother and show her I was not like my father. I was like me, that she could, she could trust me. And so, you know, I'm still doing that. I still want approval from you people. I want you to love me. I'm, I'm a middle child. Anybody who does this work, you know why you do it. Betty, Betty's so humble. Betty likes you to love him. You know he does. Even though he's the most humble man in the planet. You know that. He likes to get out the front of lot of people. So you'll love us. We need it more than anything for you guys to love us. That's why we do what we do. But you know what? Everybody's on stage and everyone needs that love. Not just the performers, but everybody needs their own version of that sense of feeling loved and good enough. And we all carry that sense of not feeling good enough with us. And that's where our work is. And if you don't have a spiritual practice, you never get to make that unconsciousness conscious. But when you get to spiritual practice, everything changes. 1972, Maureen and I walk into a Science of Mind church, and what we heard was this, all the love, all the love that you've been looking for in the conditional world is the love, the very same love that you already are. All the love that I have been seeking all my life in the world of conditions is the very same love that I already am by birthright. That's the core understanding of who you are. The issue and tissue just layers upon layers covering that up. 
And so when we do the work, we have practices that allow us to look at that, to look at how it comes up and how it shows up in our life. And it shows up in all different kinds of ways. That, that sense of entitlement. I am entitled to this because I'm Richard Levy. And then the other sense of being unworthy. And the two of them sort of meeting and sort of strangling me sometimes. I get to bring awareness to that. Because the moment you make your goal to awaken, you can use any conditions or any circumstance for that goal of awakening. And you'll find that everything that comes to your life is an opportunity to do just that. Everything, no matter what it is, no matter how difficult it is, is an opportunity to do that. On a more um, uh, mundane level, because my life is very mundane most of the time, I, I walk into the room on Wednesday, I'm getting ready to set up for my class, class here, and I've got my, um, my big flip chart, and it's got the quote from Eckhart Tolle, my class is going to be called Attention. Here and now, wake up, and I'm all ready to share this little tidbit of what I did on Sunday. And I walk in and, oh, look, someone left a mess here in the room. Oh, oh look, there's a pencil and there's paper and someone left a CD over here. And there's some wires left over there and there's a ladder leaning up against my doorway. And oh, and the door is open and that room in the back is getting to be a mess again. And there's that choice point. Choose once. Again, I'm entitled to be treated better than this. I've been a minister for 33 years, and why do I have to clean everything up? You hear me now? <laughs> In that moment, there is a choice point. What do I want to do with this moment? It's always about what you want to do in the moment. What do you want to choose? What's the quality of energy I want running through my body right now? That's the question that begs your answer. What do you want to do with this? Make a long list of who to blame, or decide, you know what? Attention, wake up, here and now, clean it up. And I went and took two seconds to clean it up. It wasn't a big deal, and I'll talk to whoever it is, and maybe they'll change what they do, and maybe they won't, it won't matter, because I made a choice not to let that Cro-Magnon man ruin the rest of the day, because he will, she will, believe me. Choice point comes again. I'm at the doctor's office getting the x-ray of the hip and the knee to get a look at what's going on. And we go in, and I love the medical model, as you all do. And the office is packed with too many people, and we're just one of too many people. And we're going to have to spend $50 of our own money, even though we pay all the, you know, and that the mind can start doing it again. You understand what happens. The same choice point is right there to start blaming, oh, this system and what's wrong, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, wait a minute, just wait. So we wait and wait, and wait, and wait, and find that, go and get the x-ray, and then we come back again, and we wait, and wait, and wait, to finally get in a room to wait, wait and wait, and wait. Do you notice your life is wait, and wait, and wait? There it is, that's what it is. Well, if I'm a meditator, what's the problem with waiting? <laughs> I love to wait. Sit still, be quiet, choose what quality of energy you want running through your body in that moment. So Maureen's reading this magazine, O Magazine, it's this beautiful three-point talk, you can use some Sunday, and I said, yeah, maybe I will, and we're just waiting. And then the PA comes in, a very sweet man, and he puts up um, my next series of choices. A little bit more deeper now on the, on the scale. First he shows me um, the, the x-ray of my knee, and he goes, and then my hip. Do you want the good news first, he says. And what do you say? How many people have said her part? Do you want the good news first? Yes. Yes, your knee is fine. <laughs> However, <laughs> do you see this left hip? That's a good hip. Do you see the right hip? You, there's supposed to be some space here in between, and you don't got a whole lot of space right there. You've got some arthritis going on in your body. And I went, oh, wow. He goes, however, you weren't in pain before you fell off the bicycle. I said, no, I wasn't. He's going, well, then maybe you should just keep doing what you were doing and, and just stay in good shape and work out and stay strong. And if you're feeling better, and guess what? I am feeling better. Just keep doing what you've been doing. And you know what? That was really good news. <laughs> Although it was heavy news, it was good news. Guess what? The body's temporary. Hello. Hello. You see, when you do these practices, you develop what I call X-ray vision. You become a superwoman and a superman. 
The powers and abilities fall beyond those who have no spiritual practice. Yes, you're able to look at whatever's going on and say, oh look, of course, the body is temporary. Behind that is a spiritual essence that is much greater than my body. That is forever, never dies, never gets sick, and never ages. That's what this can show me. Oh, I'm in a room and they didn't clean the room up. So, what? It's a moment to be alive or go, go to sleep. What do you want to do? Waiting in a room. Waiting in traffic, waiting at the light. So what are you doing with that time? X-ray vision allows you to see through the delusions that put you back to sleep again. That's how you're awakening to the real issue of who you are. It becomes your major priority. And when it becomes your major priority, everything can be in service to that. Everything. Especially the things that you don't like and the people you don't like, and the stuff that's going on with your body that you don't like. They can all be part of the same process of awakening. Isn't that beautiful? That's what we're here to do. So um, I've got a, a dream that I had the other night, and I, I shared this with Maureen. I need two chairs up here with Maureen. And in this dream, I'm, I'll get the other seat too. I'm in, I'm in a car with, uh, with my mother. She's 25 years old, 24 years old, and my three siblings, I'm back there too. Uh, there's Lisa and Richard and Debbie, A, 5, and 2. And my mother is taking us away from this very toxic situation. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat, but I'm an adult. Remember at the beginning of the talk when I talked about if you could see what was going on as an adult and totally have a different interpretation of it? In this moment, I am an adult sitting and witnessing what was going on for my mother, who was gorgeous, looked just like Catherine Hepburn. And I see my, my three siblings and me in the back, scared to death, and I'm, I'm just gently rubbing my mom's shoulders, kind of like I do Maureen's shoulders. I know every spot on her body that's tense, because I placed most of it there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know where my mother's tension is, too. In that moment, I'm the passenger witness in the seat, able to say to my mom as I whisper in her ear, Mom, everything is going to turn out okay. We're going to be all right. We make it. We make it. We're going to make it. <laughs> it's okay, Mom. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to make it. Thank you for being my mom and giving me the opportunity to experience this awakening hadn't been for you and dad and the way you were, I wouldn't be the way I am. I wouldn't have made the choices that I'd make in my life. Thank you, Mom. And you know, Mom, when you said to me, you're just like your father, you were right. I am just like my Heavenly Father, who art within me. Hallowed be thy name. And you know, when, when, when at 40 years old, I didn't get any of the money, you've heard this before, from my dad's estate, the truth was, I had a deep sense of feeling entitled to it. So all I did was transfer that sense of entitlement to my Heavenly Father. Because I always felt taken care of. <laughs> and now God's taken care of me. And thank you for the opportunity to transfer it from a limited physical source to a spiritual abundance source that never, ever runs out. That was the gift I got from Alvin. And the gift from Rhoda was the gift of being a trustworthy person. <clears throat> because she felt she couldn't trust me because I was like Alvin. I became a very trustworthy person. Isn't that true, Maureen? And if I'm nothing else, I'm trustworthy. I may be deluded, but I'm trustworthy. You can trust my word. I really try to live up to that the best I can. So let's take a look now at what we've been yelling and screaming about here for a few moments. We'll get to our lesson summation. And here it is. Everyone suffers from the core belief that I am not good enough. You can just assume that when you see someone. No matter how good they look, or how successful they are, or how much they have what you think you want, and how great they alive should be because they got what you want, they have the same issue of self-worth. The unresolved issue of self-worth creates the condition of our embodiment. So we're here to awaken from the false belief of unworthiness. To break it up from the dream that our God is a God who says we're originally sinful. Lie! You are originally innocent. <laughs> That's what we're uncovering now. Two, when your awakening becomes your number one priority, then everything you experience takes on a different quality and a different meaning in your life. Three, remember this. 
take this home with you. The beloved passenger seat who is the one who loves you with unconditional love. Wants you to know this at the deepest level of your being. No matter what you're going through or growing through, this is always the deepest truth. All the love that I am seeking in the world of conditions is the very same love that I already am. Let's say that together. All the love that I am seeking in the world of conditions is the very same love that I already am. And not only are you worthy of it, it is a great gift to receive it in any way you can during this precious day. I invite you with your lovely open heart of the mother in one hand and the father of the wisdom in, in the other hand to bring it all together as you practice, my friends, not just for yourself, but for the benefit of all beings who share this time on planet Earth with you. Namaste.